I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Ken Griffin as our first keynote lecture of the 6th EES Congress. Ken will uh, no doubt, I'm sure, be familiar to many of you in his role as curator of the Egypt Centre in Swansea, but also because of his extraordinary efforts to engage audiences across the world with Egyptian heritage during the global pandemic. Um, it therefore gives me enormous pleasure to have worked with Ken, not just on this Congress, but also through the pandemic as well, uh, and to say that today he will be talking about the historic links between the Egypt Exploration Society and the collection at the Egypt Centre. So many thanks, Ken, for kicking off the sixth EES Congress. Over to you. Well, thank you, Carl, for that introduction. And it certainly gives me great pleasure to open the EES Congress with this keynote lecture. And for many uh, years, there have been strong links between the uh, university here at Swansea, as well as the society, uh, some of which I'll be highlighting uh, today in this topic. And so really, when I was thinking about a topic for this presentation, uh, I was immediately really drawn to the EES material that we have uh, housed here in the Egypt Centre, the Swansea University's own museum. Before looking at the material, though, it's important to have a very brief introduction uh, to the museum itself. I'm sure many of you are familiar with it already, so I will keep it relatively brief. Uh, but there may be some people in the audience who are not familiar uh, with the, um, the Egypt Centre. The, let's see that didn't work properly. Uh, so the Egypt Centre is a small museum of approximately 6,000 objects. Uh, which is located in single, Singleton campus of Swansea University. We opened to the public in 1998, and the museum attracts around 20,000 visitors annually. Yet the history of the collection actually goes back much further. The Egypt Centre is a small museum. Uh, that's not worked. Um, just something that's not working here. Apologies. Let me do that. So two thirds of the, the, the collection uh, that came to Swansea originated from the pharmaceutical giant, Sir Henry Solomon Welcome, who was one of the founders of Burroughs Welcome and Co. Um, should be on that slide. Uh, Burroughs Welcome and Co. Uh, and not only was Welcome associated with the medical practice, but he was also an avid collector who would send his agents to various auction houses in order to hoover up what they could uh, really get their hands on, and that was from objects from all different countries. He created the Welcome Museum, uh, Histor Welcome Historical Medical Museum, I should say, um, which would display just this very small part of his collection. You can see a photograph of some of the uh, objects on display here, including some Egyptian objects on the right hand side. By the time he died in 19, uh, uh, 1936, his collection was estimated to be well over a million items. Two thirds of the objects that we have in the Egypt Center collection actually originate uh, from the pharmaceutical giant Sir Henry Welcome, um, as I've already said. And you can see that some of the objects that we have here on the screen uh, are items that were unpacked at the British Museum during the dispersal of the collection. So when Welcome died, there were around 12,000 packing cases and many hundreds of freestanding items. Now, by comparison, in 1933, the Louvre collection had around about 173,000 items. Uh, so Welcome's was around about five times bigger than the Louvre in Paris. Following his death, and particularly uh, after the Second World War, the Welcome Trustees decided to uh, disperse the collection to various museums throughout the world, with over 100 museums receiving parts of his collection. So, as I say, this photo shows some of the ethnographical material let out at the British Museum in February 1955, just to give you an idea of the scale that was involved. In 1959, David Dixon was appointed as the Research Fellow at the Welcome Institute and was tasked with really classifying the Egyptian material and arranging for it to be transferred to the Petrie Museum in 1964. However, because of a lack of space at the Petrie Museum, uh, the material wasn't able to remain there. And thankfully, the Welcome Trustees agreed that the Egyptian collection could be dispersed by the Petrie Museum 
uh, which is how part of the collection ended up in Swansea. In 1970, uh, David Dixon had a, a long telephone conversation in Welsh uh, with Gwyn Griffiths. They were two avid Welsh speakers. And Gwyn Griffiths was, uh, at the time, a reader in classics at Swansea. But he was also the editor of the Society's Journal of Egyptian Archaeology. So here's one of the first links with Swansea uh, and uh, the EES. Dixon outlined the possibility of a portion of the Egyptian collection being offered to Swansea, although uh, he actually told Gwyn at the time to keep these plans uh, um, uh, secret until things had developed. So it was very much a secret telephone conversation in Welsh. In this photo, you can actually see Gwyn receiving a copy of his Feshrift, uh, which was published by the EES in, I think, 1992. He's receiving it by uh, Professor Alan Lloyd, who I'll be coming back to uh, in a little bit. In February 1971, the formal offer was made to Swansea, and in uh, September 1971, so just a few months uh, later, 92 crates of objects were collected uh, from the Petrie Museum. One of the conditions of this uh, this loan, and they are technically a loan, uh, was that the cases had to be selected unopened, which meant that it was impossible to know what kind of treasures lay within the boxes until they were unpacked at Swansea. Kate Boss Griffiths, who was the wife of Gwyn Griffiths, but also a um, Egyptologically uh, uh, trained museum person, was appointed as the honorary creator uh, uh, creator of um, uh, the Swansea Welcome Collection, uh, as it was then named, and was really tasked with cataloging the material. You can see in the photographs here that we have two photos of, uh, of Kate during the unpacking in the early 1970s. There wasn't a, a museum here at Swansea at the time, at least not on the campus, and so the objects are being unpacked in uh, a laboratory. Um, not ideal conditions really for the objects themselves, but that's all that, uh, that, that was available at the time. And note in particular the very large vessel that you see in both photographs, which was excavated by the Egypt Exploration Society at Amarna uh, sometime in the 1920s. The Swansea Welcome Museum was finally opened to the public in 1976. Uh, with Harry James, uh, who was another former editor of the Journal of Egyptian Archaeology, uh, in attendance, along with the mayor and mayoress uh, of, uh, of Swansea. You can see Harry James on the far right. And here we have Alan Lloyd once again, standing at the dawn of history, as the case is, uh, is named, who was a lecturer in classics at Swansea University at the time, uh, with both him and Gwyn. Uh, being particularly keen on inserting as much Egyptology into the teaching as possible. So although they were teaching classics, they very much had a background in Egyptology and tried to integrate it as much as possible. It wasn't actually until 2000 that Egyptology as a, as a degree was offered at Swansea Uni. Alan would later serve as the editor of the JEA uh, and was the EES chairman and later became the president of the society, again showing the strong links over the last 50 years between Swansea University uh, and the society. The Egypt Centre, as it is now known, is a purpose-built museum that opened to the public in September 1998. So next year we'll actually be celebrating our 25th anniversary, so stay tuned for uh, some celebratory events that we'll be announcing in the coming months or so. And speaking of celebratory events, uh, as many of you will know, uh, we are in the 140th uh, year of the society in its existence, initially founded as the Egypt Exploration Fund, now known as the society. Uh, so we'd like to certainly congratulate uh, the EES and their team on this wonderful achievement. Uh, it certainly is a major institution, uh, not just in the UK, but throughout the world in uh, dealing with Egyptian heritage. And on that note, I'd like to just kind of say, of course, to support the, the EES for all their hard work that they have been doing over the last 140 years, and in particular with the, with the current work. 
I'm not going to go into any detail about the society's history, uh, since I'm sure many of you will be familiar with it. And there's certainly more qualified people on here that, uh, that could discuss it than me. But in summary, the society was formed to examine uh, and excavate in areas of Egypt and the Sudan. The intent was to study and analyze the results of the excavation and to publish the information uh, for the scholarly world, such as in their, uh, their journal, the Egyptian uh, Journal of Egyptian Archaeology. The society has worked at well-known sites such as Abydos, Amarna, Armand, Buhen, Deir el-Bahri, Jibal el-Silsila, Nacratis, Saqqara, Tanis, and countless other places over the last uh, 140 years. Many of the objects excavated by the society are now housed in museums throughout the world, including the Egypt Center, which has over 1,000 objects originated from the, uh, the Egypt Exploration Society in some kind of capacity. So what I'm going to do over the next um, 30 minutes or so is present some of the objects that we have in the Egypt Center collection, which do originate uh, from, the, from the society. And they can be broken down into a number of groups, uh, as you can see from the slide here. The earliest material from the EES to arrive to Swansea was in 1971, as part of the Welcome Collection. This was a loan uh, that we received of around 4,000 objects. And as noted earlier, it was only during the unpacking that it became possible to see what objects were involved here. In 1978, we also had an additional donation of probably around about uh, 350 objects. This came from the British Museum, but the British Museum in turn received them two years prior from the EES. So most of, if not all of them, can be traced back, back to the EES excavations. Further donations after that include some from the British Museum, from Aberystwyth University, uh, a loan from Woking College, and several private uh, individuals over the years, uh, some of whom I'll be mentioning in today's talk. There's also the Armand unpublished material, and I've put an asterisk next to it because it's somewhat, uh, ha it has a slightly complex history. Uh, so I will talk about that in due course. Oh. First of all, looking at the EES collection. Now in the 1920s, Henry Welcome financially supported the society, uh, particularly with their work at Amarna and Armand. In exchange for the support, as was common at the time, the Welcome Historical Medical Museum received a portion of the finds. And we are fortunate that archives in the Welcome collection provide lists of the, uh, of the objects that Welcome received as part of the excavations, both at Armand uh, 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 between 1929 and 1931, and from Amarna at least between 1928 and 1936. Here's just two, two pages that I've put on the screen. The uh, partial list on the left is objects from Amarna during the, uh, the 1930 to 31 season. And the list on the right hand side is objects that were received from Armand during the 1929 to 1931 uh, season. A lot of the objects that we have from Amarna originating from the EES are actually now on display in our newly refurbished Amarna case, uh, which is in the House of Life Gallery at the Egypt Centre. So if you're able to visit us uh, during the 1st and 2nd of October for the EES conference, you'll be able to see these objects uh, in person on display. So let's look at some of the objects that we have in there. You may have noticed in the lower left-hand corner of the case, it was a very large object. It's actually one of the largest objects that we have in the museum, and certainly one of the heaviest. Having moved it three times, I can certainly attest for it. And I hope that I never have to move it again because it does weigh a lot. But W490 is a limestone slab, which was excavated in the north suburb of Amarna, uh, T36.11 to give it its full designation uh, of the area where it was found. And it was found during the 1929 to 30 season. But what exactly is this object? 
It's actually one that kind of baffled the uh, the excavators who were unsure themselves when they had discovered it at the time, as you can see from the quote that I put on the screen. This is from the publication. And it says, the bath is standing behind a screen wall in what we have called the anointing room uh, because we found a long block of limestone there with three cups with traces of grease. Well, that's the slab that we just seen. Whether ointment or oil was poured into the cups or whether the cups were merely, merely served to steady vessels, which were put on the blocks, we cannot decide. The grease in the cups, cu cups was not very excessive or deep sunk, uh, deeply sunk in. So the last assumption is most probable. The block fits exactly on the ridge on seven bricks, which are plastered to the floor, which is not quite in line with any other wall. So they're unsure really what it's being used for. One possibility that they do suggest is that it may have been used uh, for, um, uh, for really steady and vessels that could potentially be put in it. And here you can actually see uh, in this photograph, um, this is an archival one from the EES, the actual slab in place within the room that it was discovered. Not only that, uh, but you can see uh, that right next to it, uh, you've got this stool. I'll come back to that stool in just a second. What you'll also notice just about is the seven bricks which are underneath the slab, uh, as mentioned in the excavation report. The limestone stool, however, is quite interesting because that's also an object that made its way to Swansea. So it's really fantastic that we have both these objects that were found together in 1929, which are now on display together almost 100 years later in our Amarna case in the House of Life gallery. So that's W344. As for what the object was used for, as the excavators note, uh, it may have been used for holding pottery. And while we cannot be completely sure what the slab was used for, we have put it on display as a pot stand. The main reason for doing this really is to save space. If we wanted to put both the pot stand and the pots on display, well, sorry, I called it a pot stand. If we want to put this slab on display with the pots uh, separately, then it's going to take up too much room in the case. So really it's to condense uh, the objects into this case, albeit by perhaps given the wrong interpretation as to what this slab may have been used for. But it, I think those, those pots certainly do look very nice uh, sitting on the, the slab. And of course, these are pots that were discovered by the society during their excavations at Amarna in the 1920s, including the large pot that you see there, which is recently undergoing conservation at uh, the Cardiff Conservation Department uh, and is returned to us. What you'll also notice in the upper left-hand side is five painted uh, five pieces of painted plaster. And that's what I'll come on to next. These are actually part of 31 painted plaster fragments which are housed in the Egypt Center, all of which originate from the North Riverside Palace at Amarna. This is just a small selection of some of them which are on the screen today. And you can see that some of them have rosettes, have, uh, have water lilies or lotuses, uh, some grapes, as well as uh, other patterning. So they're from the North Riverside Palace, but what would they originally have looked like? Reconstructions of the architecture was produced by uh, Ralph uh, uh, Levers, who was part of the excavation team in the 1920s and early 1930s. And he produced this reconstruction of one of the doorways based on fragments of the painted plaster, such as those in Swansea, that were found fallen on the ground. So this is his line drawing of a, uh, of a doorway, which has been overlaid with some of the fragments that we have here in Swansea, just to give an idea of what this doorway would have looked like. We also have another piece of painted plaster, which is perhaps the most important of all the pieces that we have here, uh, and that's W802. What is it actually depicting? Well, it seems to be the elbow, uh, it certainly seems to be the elbow of an individual. But who is this individual? 
Is it Akhenaten or is it somebody else? Could it be his, uh, his successor, Smechakare, for example? The excavators actually believe that this was part of a large chariot scene of Akhenaten and Nefertiti right in their chariots, as is commonly seen uh, in the, uh, the tombs at Amarna, but it's now interpreted as being part of an offering scene. Note in particular the very elaborate uh, sash that he's wearing around his, uh, his waist, and the watercolour that you see on the right-hand side was produced uh, for the, um, uh, the, the, this piece shortly after the discovery uh, by, uh, by the artists as part of the mission at Amarna. Now, Levers also uh, reconstructed the, the, uh, the, the Grand North Gate that you have of the North Riverside Palace, uh, which includes this scene of Akhenaten and Nefertiti riding their chariots, as I've already mentioned, this iconography being very common at the site of Amarna in some of the tombs. And the painted plaster fragments that we have in the Egypt Centre, the 31, really just give us a glimpse into what this colourful palace must have really looked like at the time of its uh, construction. Uh, unfortunately, obviously, when it was discovered, those fragments were found uh, on the ground. So we are very fortunate that we have such a significant collection of the painted plaster fragments from the site. And there were, are many other objects from Amarna, which come from the Welcome Loan, uh, which I could really present here today. Due to time uh, constraints, I'm just going to mention this last one from the Welcome Collection, uh, which is a stone fragment of a statue, likely depicting Akhenaten himself, holding a tray of offerings. And there are certainly similar ones that have been found uh, at the site of Amarna and are now in museums today, such as the Cairo Museum. It's thanks to the wonderful object card that you see on the right hand side, which have been digitized by the EES and are available for people to consult online, that has been possible to, uh, to get more information on this particular uh, statue fragment. You may just be able to see that we have the number written on the object on the side of it. Uh, so it's got the number 511 as well as the date on the side. And the card on the right actually tells us that the fragment was found on the 23rd of December 1931 in the so-called priest's quarters, uh, P43.1, uh, uh, as it's uh, as it's labelled in the plan, which was part of the central city of Amarna. So we're able to trace this object right back to its find spot and even to the day that it was actually discovered on the 23rd of December 1931, which is always quite exciting to be able to do. Now, the other site that I'd like to mention where Welcome received a lot of his objects from is Armand. And while certainly not as well known as Amarna, the site of Armand was equally important. It's located just nine kilometers to the southwest of Luxor and has a rich history from the prehistoric times through to modern times. The site was referenced or referred to in classical times as Hermonthus and is known for its catacombs dedicated to the sacred Bucchus bull, the so-called Bucchium. But there was also an additional necropolis for the mother of the Bucchus bull, uh, which was referred to as the Bacaria. Both of these being excavated by the Egypt Exploration Society in the 1920s and 30s. And on the right hand side, you can see one of the archival photographs from the EES during the excavation of the Bukhim, showing the scale of the work that was involved in this, uh, this excavation. Now, while we have lots of objects from uh, uh, Armand in the Egypt Center collection, over 700 actually, uh, the one that's really the most spectacular is this stela, which dates to the reign of Commodus. And it depicts the Roman emperor on the far right hand side, uh, who is making an offering, burning incense and pouring a libation before the recumbent uh, mother of the Bucchus bull. So not the Bucchus bull itself, but the mother of the Bucchus bull, which because it was the mother of the bull becomes a sacred uh, or becomes a uh, an animal of devotion uh, by um, association. The stele itself was found just in front of tomb 27 within the Bacaria, 
uh, during the EES excavations. And the five line inscription that you have directly beneath the scene provides the date of the burial for this cow, which took place in the 30th year of Commodus's reign, which can date this precisely to AD 190 AD. This is another extremely heavy item that we have in the Egypt Center collection. You can see just how thick uh, the actual uh, stone is itself, and it is considerably large. What we also have in the collection is 25 coffin clamps, as they're commonly referred to, most of which originate from tomb 13 within the Bakaria. This photograph was actually taken by a Cardiff Conservation student, Erin Foster, who sent it to me last night. And she's currently finishing up a research paper um, as part of her MA, uh, carrying out some analysis of the content of the, uh, the copper that is used here for these coffin clamps, as well as uh, carrying out some conservation work on the clamps, which will hopefully be returning to Swansea in the next few weeks. You can see that while the majority of them are all similar shape, those ones from Tomb 13, there are a few that are different shape and size, and uh, they date to a different period uh, at, um, uh, at uh, our month. So what exactly were these coffin clamps used for? Well, here's another archival photograph that we have from, uh, from the EES. And this is depicting the burial of one of the mother of the Book of Spools from Bakaria tomb 14. And the clamps themselves were used for facilitating the burial of these sacred bovines, uh, which were attached to wooden, uh, uh, with the clamps attached to wooden boards. Now, while the boards themselves have long since deteriorated, uh, the clamps remain in place. So you can see that they're on three different levels uh, above one another on the far right hand side. And what the Egyptians would uh, seem to have been doing was be, would be to pass the bandages through these coffin clamps and then the body uh, of the, uh, the cow would be placed in and they would be able to use the clamps to pull the, 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 the strips um, of bandage around. Uh, at least that's what the embalming ritual tells us uh, for these clamps. Another significant object of, uh, of note is this one, a statue of Teti. It's a, gra a granodiorite statue, which was published in the excavation report as belonging to an official called Minhotep. However, a re-evaluation of the inscription, uh, which is quite worn in numerous parts, reveals that it actually belongs to a man called Teti, son of Min Aa. And it's the Min Aa element that was uh, uh, erroneously interpreted as being Min Hotep, um, and it's quite easy to see how it was done in such a way. Teti is actually quite a well known official. Uh, he's known from numerous statues and stele, and he can be uh, dated precisely to the 13th dynasty, to the reigns of Subic Hotep III and Nefer Hotep I, where he served uh, as chancellor uh, during their reigns. So a very well-known individual. The statue is still unpublished and there's very few people who actually, uh, or at least not fully published, there's very few people who know that uh, this is really in Swansea belonging to a person of pity. But there's going to be, what, uh, 78 people in the audience who now know uh, about it. So hopefully this will be published in due course. And the uh, not quite the final objects that I want to talk about for uh, uh, Armand are those that originate from tomb 205, a less spectacular group of objects. And while the tomb itself had been dated by the excavators to the early dynastic period, they noted that most of the tombs in that area had been reused during the Roman era. The tomb was only briefly mentioned in a JEA article from 1920, uh, 1931, uh, comprising of the excavations that were conducted between 1929 and 31. It does, however, contain a number of plates showing some of the objects that were found. And it seems that the entire contents of the tomb were actually presented by Myers, the excavator at Armand, to the Wellcome Historical Medical Museum in 1932. Presumably after he had published the article, he felt that he had uh, finished with the material and donated 42 objects uh, individually catalogued in the Wellcome archives uh, to the museum. At least nine of these 
as you can see on the screen, are now in Swansea. But I have no idea where the other 33 objects are. Uh, I have asked um, Ashley Cook in Liverpool. They don't seem to have any, and I know Campbell's here today. Maybe Campbell has some from Tomb 205, or certainly some of the other museums that received the dispersal of the Welcome Collection. Most of it is jewellery, uh, as you can see here, uh, earrings, uh, uh, beads, uh, etc. And the last objects that I want to mention from Armand are these two uh, uh, spheroconical vessels, as they're often referred to. They have a very distinctive uh, type or shape, which has been excavated uh, in many Islamic countries. And the function has sparked a lot of debates as to what exactly they were. So although some examples are made of gla glazed ceramic, stone, glass, the vast majority of them are actually made of a hard, fired, uh, dense, unglazed earthenware, such as the two that we have here. They've been interpreted as containers for mercury, grenades for containing Greek fire, flasks for containing fizzy alcohol or other liquids, holy water bottles, or even lamps, loom weights, or decorative finnels from, uh, from architecture. There's actually an excellent video online where you can watch about these uh, by a scholar discussing them uh, from a secure archaeological context. I, I think it was in Lebanon. Uh, and it seems that there's, there's evidence to indicate that they were multifunctional, that they may have initially been used for carrying liquids, um, uh, such as for drinking or for ointment, uh, be before they were reused as grenades uh, during the Crusades and they were filled with uh, so-called Greek fire before being thrown. So these are our um, grenades uh, that we have in the Egypt Center collection, as we like to refer to them by. Now, the second collection that I want to talk about is the so-called disposable collection. In, 19, in, in July 1976, the British Museum registered a large batch of objects that were donated that year by the Egypt Exploration Society. And they're described in the excavation register as miscellaneous items from early excavations. The following sites are uh, noted in the uh, British Museum records. So Necratus, Amarna, Armant, Abydos, El Kab, Sasebi, Das Palace Parva, El Amra, Amara West, Buto, Kasser Ibrahim, uh, to name just a few. And they include objects such as pottery, stonework, metalwork, shaptis, uh, quite a wide variety of objects. Uh, all in all, the British Museum retained around about uh, 200 of these objects. But in March 19, uh, 1978, Kate, Kate Boss Griffiths has visited the museum. Kate, as we know, was the curator of the, uh, the collection here in Swansea at the time. And she was offered the Spur Antiquities from the Egypt Exploration Society, which had don been donated by the uh, um, uh, donated to the British Museum, you can actually see uh, part of the correspondence in Kate's 1978 day book, which was recently transcribed by Egypt Centre volunteer Dulcie Ingle, in which she talks about visiting uh, on the 15th of March at 1978. That's her plans in place for it. And further entries into the day book. Uh, talk about um, on the Monday, the 13th, arranging for the visits, the final arrangements, and then on the 15th uh, to go to London to fetch the objects from the British Museum, noting that they're really um, uh, from the EES. But if you look in the earlier entry, the top one, she actually refers to it as a treasure hunt. She has no idea what the objects are going to be, of course. Oh, go back. So what exactly did we have? Now, while the British Museum had the first pick of the objects uh, in 1976, by uh, two years later, there were certainly some treasures that were gifted to Swansea. The objects were accompanied by a three-page list that was uh, compiled by Jeff Spencer. And Kate also compiled her own list in the dairies, as you can see on the screen here. Not all the objects, um, in the list have been paired up with their current museum numbers, as Kate didn't, uh, didn't always give them numbers at the time. 
Uh, so we're continuing to identify these objects that were donated at the time and finding out that they are uh, relating back to EES excavations. So to date, we have over 300 items from this donation, with the, the number likely to increase as time goes on. So what were the objects? Well, here you can see just a small selection of some of the items that were presented uh, to the Egypt Centre or to the, the Swansea Welcome Museum, as it was called at the time. And the vast majority of them come from excavations at Amarna. They're very small. They're not particularly noteworthy. I would say for most people, but they do contain uh, many ring bezels, uh, faience items, pottery, flints, etc., many of which still contain their excavation numbers, which is very useful. And others have since been identified as coming from the EES excavations by pairing them up with the EES record cards, which are now online. Certainly the ring bezels and pendants are particularly uh, interesting, with many of them being published in the excavation reports. Most are made out of faience uh, and uh, are really coming from, uh, are providing the names of the Amarna rulers from Amenhotep III right through to Tutankhamun. You also have some with wajit eye decoration, others that contain flowers or animals. Most, unfortunately, are broken, uh, which is not too surprising given their, their small size and delicate nature. But some of them can be really beautiful. And a good example of one that is broken but is equally beautiful is this ring bezel. So this is uh, EC3009A, uh, which contains the... Um, uh, the, the, the name of the god amun Re, written in an open work form. Now, the bezel appears to have uh, arrived in Swansea in two parts, uh, which have recently been reunited and affixed together. Now, since amun Re is present, uh, uh, sorry, is persecuted during the reign of Akhenaten, uh, we can assume that this ring was probably produced during the time of Tutankhamun, when he restored the old religion. The faint excavation number on the back suggests that, that it was discovered during the 19, uh, 1922 season and that it had the number uh, 23 on it. But when I looked in the EES records, as you can see on the far right hand side here, the actual drawing of the object was missing. It had been cut out. So thanks to Anna Stevens and uh, uh, Stephanie Bunstra, a copy of the drawing was located in the archives in Cairo, which confirms that this is a match with the object that we have in Swansea. So it can thus be determined that this object was excavated by the EES on the 26th of October, 1921, uh, within the, um, the living room of House 11. That's the Long Wall Street uh, in the workman's village of Amarna. So we can very precisely date uh, this object and give it the location as to where it's coming from. Now, certainly the most interesting of the ring bezels that we have in Swansea is W1150, which immediately attracted the attention of Kate Boss Griffiths upon its arrival in Swansea. Note that the record card actually says that it's deposited in the office. So this was written, obviously, before it was dispersed in 1976. It depicts a lute player accompanied by a monkey, which is fairly common iconography at Amarna. It was discovered in the northern suburb, U36.8 uh, and uh, 9, uh, during the 1926 to 27 season, and has recently been republished by uh, my predecessor, uh, Carolyn Graves Brown. So I won't discuss it in any great detail. There are other provenances that we have from the British Museum loan in 1976 that can be traced to Abydos. Bubastis, Daryl Bahri, Ignaciel Medina, Nacratus, uh, Nabasha, and Sisebi. And no doubt, as we look into these records further, we might be able to trace other objects that we have. One that was identified quite recently is W678, a wooden funerary figure, which was only traced to the 1978 donation, thanks to the conservation record that you can see on the right-hand side. Uh, this is just the cover sheet of it, but it actually tells us that this was an object donated by the British Museum in March of that year. And you can see that the drawing matches up with the picture. We had assumed 
up until this point that this was an object that came to us via the welcome collection. Now, while the figure entered the collection without any provenance, and some Egyptologists who had visited even suggested that this was a fake due to the overly large eyes. Research by Egypt Centre volunteer Sam Powell has actually shown that this is coming from the EES excavations at Deir el Bahri. And excellent parallels to this figure can be found in the British Museum, Bristol, Liverpool, Cheltenham, uh, and other museums. And certainly these confirm both the provenance and the authenticity of the figure. So as always, it's important to look at parallels. And here is one of the complete boat boats that was found at Deir el Bahri by the EES, which is now in the Royal Ontario Museum in Canada. It has the exact same figures, the type of figures, clearly all coming from the same workshop. And this was excavated within the Temple of Montehotep II at Deir el Bahri by the EES during the 1926, uh, 1906 and 1907 seasons. The list that was created by Kate mentions 150 Shaptis without giving any further details. And with over 400 Shaptis in the Egypt Centre collection, such as those that are shown on the, the screen here, it's difficult to really identify which ones came from the 1978 donation and, donation and which ones may have come from Welcome, although it's certainly not impossible. So for example, EC, 2034 and EC2035 uh, have no archival information whatsoever. Uh, but we do have direct parallels to these in the British Museum, which are listed as coming from Abydos. Uh, the excavation, or sorry, the acquisition history in the British Museum actually says that it was presented by the EES in 1976, which is the same time that this disposable collection was transferred. And I should have put the photos of those figures up, but clearly I've forgotten to do so. So moving on to the, the next group of Shaptis, this army of Shaptis, we have 99 belonging to this guy. They're all clearly from the same set and based on parallels in numerous museums, they have a secure provenance. They come from the excavations at Tel Nabasha, which was undertaken by Flinders Petrie. Three of the examples that we have in the Egypt Center collection, such as the one in the center there, have a single line of hieroglyphs, but it's written slightly differently each time, making the name of the owner somewhat prob problematic. There's another really interesting group of objects that we have coming from uh, the EES donation in 1976, which has intrigued me for quite a long time because they seem to be a very random mix of objects. The only thing that really connects them together is the label that you have written with all, uh, written on them, either in black or in white, uh, which gives Egypt and then the number usually written within a box. They appear to be a random collection of miscellaneous objects, including stone pallets, pottery, coffin hands and beards, stone sculpture, and other quite dodgy looking objects. But were these objects really part of the EES collection? What does the numbering system relate to? My first thoughts uh, were that they were perhaps donated to the British Museum by a private individual before they became mixed in with the EES material that was presented to Swansea in 1976. And certainly talking to Jeff Spencer, he did say that they did have a, um, um, a cupboard full of antiquities or antiquities that had been presented to the museum by various people that certainly were of dodgy nature in terms, in terms of their authenticity. However, after visiting Bolton Museum just uh, a year ago, I spotted similar objects that had the same numbering system. And here you can see three on the, um, uh, the screen here. So my immediate thought was to really check with Bolton to see if they have any details in their archival records. And upon contacting Ian Trumbull, the curator there, I was informed that these objects uh, were all donated to the museum in 1966 by the Egypt Exploration Society. So it's very clear that the ones that we have with the numbering system are coming from the EES. And what's more is that the objects that they have in Bolton, or at least some of them, can be traced back to Petrie's excavations at both Necratus as well as 
tell the finner. So for example, this item that you see on the screen here of a nude um, limestone figure is illustrated on plate 19 of the Necratus publication with this uh, line drawing that you see on the right. So clearly some of the objects with this numbering system originate from the EES excavations. But what does the numbering itself relate to? This I have been unable to establish. Um, was it perhaps a numbering system that was added to it by, uh, during the excavation or during a, uh, a temporary exhibition that was perhaps put on by the society? I really don't know. So if anybody in the audience is able to shed light onto this, I don't know if Stephanie's with this today and has come across this number before, I would be very, very grateful. In 1980, we received a donation of four shaptis from the British Museum. <clears throat> and two of the figures can be traced back to the EES excavations based on their parallels. So on the left hand side, you have W1313, which can be dated to the 26th dynasty and contains an inscription naming the owner of Ankhpeth Heri, born of Ter, which is followed by uh, chapter six of the Book of the Dead. This shafti was discovered by Grenfell and Hunt during their excavations at the site of El Hiba between 1902 and 1903. W1314 on the right is a 21st dynasty shafti belonging to a person called Ankh Sen Ptah, a female god servant of Mut. Uh, this one was excavated by Mace and Randall MacIver at Abydos in the North Cemeteries, Cemetery D, uh, tomb number eight during the 19, uh, 1899 to 1900 seasons. So we can be very precise as to the tomb that this object is coming from. In 1970, uh, 1997, we received, received a donation of around 130 objects from Aberystwyth University Muse uh, uh, Museum. The majority of the objects were donated to Aberystwyth by John uh, Bancroft Willens, uh, who was a subscriber to the EES and the British School of Archaeology in Egypt. Now, records accompanying the donation include a letter written by Margaret Murray, which you can see on the screen here, in which she describes them as being small objects or small things, which I had brought home with me. Now, she was working in Abydos uh, prior to this donation. Uh, so it could be that the objects that she's referring to were brought back from Abydos, uh, where she had just returned working with Petrie and the EES. Perhaps, though, it's uh, not so clear, because as she actually says in her note, it's impossible to date some of the objects, because one does not know where they were found. So did she perhaps purchase these objects during the excavation season for Willens, rather than them being actual objects that come from secure archaeological contexts? This we don't know. So it's impossible to really say if these objects that I'm going to show you are technically uh, objects from the EES excavations. And here's a list that accompanied the objects that was produced by Margaret Murray uh, for Willens. And many of them have been matched up with objects that we now have in the Egypt Center collection, which you can see on the screen now. And so this is just a, a sample of around 50 objects from Abydos, uh, or allegedly from Abydos, uh, coming from uh, Upper Ispith. One of our most recent donations was in 2021, <clears throat> which was. Uh, Quite an interesting one. So in, in March 20, 2021, we received a large donation of over, over 1,000 Egyptological books from a lady called Armella Stevens. Now, because of the COVID-19 rules in place at the time, a colleague from the library had to travel to Mid Wales in order to collect the books on his own. So I wasn't able to go with him. When he arrived back at Swansea and we were unloading the boxes, I was quite surprised to find that there was one that contained several Egyptian objects. We weren't aware that there were objects going to be presented to us. And of course, this is problematic uh, for um, ethical reasons to be accepting objects without any history before 1980. Now, fortunately, uh, unfortunately for us, the owner had dementia and so was unable to tell us where the objects were originating from. 
However, two of the Shaktis were instantly familiar to me, uh, particularly as we have parallels to them already in the Egypt Center collection. EC 1981, which is on the left hand side, can be traced back to excavations at uh, Tel Nabasha. And we currently have 12 other examples of the same type of Shapti in the Egypt Center collection. EC uh, 1980, which you see here on the left hand side, is inscribed for a man called Wenenefer and is the same owner as W5023 that we have in the Egypt Center collection, albeit with the inscription on this occasion written on the back. Wenenefer was the god's father of Amun, whose tomb was, the, was excavated by Mace and Rundle MacIver at Abydos, Cemetery T, uh, D once again, this time in tomb 15G. So while the acquisition of W5023 is unknown, this is perhaps another object that the Egypt Center received in the 1978 donation, uh, which we initially assumed was coming from the Welcome uh, collection. And another fragment that I showed you from this, this donation was a piece of limestone, EC 1978. This was more difficult to identify, although the number 26 on the back did provide a clue. Knowing that the two Shaptis were from the EES excavations, I hazard a guess that this one might also be coming from the EES, and so I searched through the EES archives uh, for objects coming from Amarna and found that number 26 matched this object card that you see on the right hand side, which is a piece coming from the 1934 to 35 season. So the records actually tell us that this is coming from the Great Palace uh, at Amarna. What's more is that the fragment actually joins with a piece that uh, was recorded earlier in the season. Um, here you have it on the right hand side, but the current whereabouts of this fragment is unknown. It could very well be in another private collection. It's difficult to really say. So where did Armella Stevens uh, receive these objects from? How did she get the objects from the EES? Well, the answer perhaps lies uh, with um, other donations that we've received from private individuals, including the late Anthony Donahue. Anthony Donahue purchased around about uh, 20 ring bezels from the EES office in the 1960s, when it seems that surplus material was being sold off at the offices prior to the move to uh, Ducky Moose, uh, where they're now residing today. And several of these ring bezels still contain the excavation marks on them, which can be traced back to Amarna. Another donation that we received from a person called Ivor Hitchens is also said to be coming from the EES office in the 1960s and was presented to us in 1990. The object can clearly be traced back to the EES excavations at Amarna, uh, and there you can see the photograph of it on the left and the EES record card on the right hand side. So once again, there could well be EES material in private collections today. And when I spoke to a friend about this a few days ago, he informed me of two other people who he was aware of who received objects or was able to purchase objects at the time um, in the 1960s. Of course, the Egypt Center is always looking to expand. So if anybody has some, do please get in touch. <clears throat> um, there's the EES um, unpublished material that I'm going to skip through because I know we don't have too much time to, to discuss that. And I just want to kind of mention some of the uh, some of the objects that we have from the EES um, unpublished material. Um, basically, in 1971, we had uh, several cases of boxes coming from the Armand excavations in 19, uh, 1935 to 1936. Uh, over 700 objects. This is objects that were unpublished by Mond and Myers at the time. They didn't get through to, uh, to, to finishing it off. And it contains objects that are flints, pottery from the Badarian period, uh, from the early dynastic period, from some really nice pan grave pottery coming from uh, the site, which were recently studied by Aaron de Souza, and also some Islamic material, which I've put onto the slide here. That includes pottery again glass weights. Uh, we have 
a miniature book which you see on the right hand side tiny little thing contains uh, little pages from uh, excerpts of the Quran and on the left hand side and center we have a leather pouch which contains protective charms written in Arabic so this is just a small collection of some of the material that we have here in Swansea from the EES excavations and I know time's running out and stuff so I'm going to quickly finish um, our online catalog if you're interested I uh, check it out if you type in or start typing in Egypt Exploration Society you'll see the drop bar come up which will give you the society with uh, 1300 items you can click on that and it will bring up all the objects that we have and what I should also say is that I'm currently working on putting an exhibition together to uh, celebrate 140 years of the EES, but also of the Egypt Center objects that we have here from the society. The case itself is empty, with the exception of the interpretation panel that was installed. But over the next four weeks, I will be adding the objects that we have, or some objects, into this case so that anybody who is attending the EES conference in person in October will be able to see the items. Uh, but you will also be able to see the items, and we have over 1,300, if you attend the virtual tour of the collection, which has taken place on the 30th of September uh, online. So you can book up for that. So I'd just like to finish off by thanking um, uh, everyone for attending this, uh, this conference, uh, this uh, keynote uh, address. And of course, to the EES staff, uh, particularly to, um, um, uh, to Charlotte, who has been uh, really excellent helping to organize this conference. And of course, to Carl for Richard in this session today. So we certainly hope to see a lot of you in person in October and certainly many of you online uh, throughout the month of September. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Ken. That was really uh, riveting stuff and uh, lots and lots of objects in there, I confess that I, I had no idea about and um, particularly interested in this uh, 1960s and uh, 76 to 78 uh, further distribution of ES objects, which uh, would be interesting to maybe have a look to our own archive here, uh, just to see what was going on uh, at that time.